seminario che organizziamo come Fondazione Portuguaro Campus. Eh, prima di questo collegamento ringraziavo tutti per l'ampissima partecipazione, veramente abbiamo avuto centinaia di iscritti oggi, quindi ci fa molto piacere. E abbiamo un ospite illustre, come dicevo prima, il professore Peter Barms, che, di cui dopo illustrerò il curriculum, e la sua gentile signora, la dottoressa Maria Pia Caserini, anch'essa studiosa dei cambiamenti climatici. So che ci sono tanti ragazzi che partecipano a questo webinar, e grazie di cuore. Abbiamo un ospite illustre, Peter Barms, eh, che dopo, di cui dopo, quando partiremo in via ufficiale, descriverò il curriculum e, e, e la lunga storia. E la, e la cortese dottoressa Maria Pia Casarini, che è la moglie del professor Adams, anche lei studiosa del, dei cambiamenti climatici e dei ghiacci. Abbiamo, abbiamo oltre 400 iscritti per il momento, non so per dare un ordine quantitativo. Siamo nella nostra bellissima biblioteca antica, eh, avevamo organizzato questo incontro, incontro con il professor, professor Barnes in, in diretta il, per il 20 aprile e purtroppo la pandemia ha costretto, ci ha costretti a fare di necessità virtù e di organizzare in forma di streaming questo incontro. Non è la stessa cosa perché gli incontri in questo bellissimo ambiente nostro e anche di persone in cui c'è un'altra un'altra partecipazione anche emotiva e non sono proprio la cosa migliore, però eh, ci adattiamo, il vantaggio di queste soluzioni che permettono di raggiungere molte più persone e quindi siamo contenti anche di questa ampia partecipazione. Ok, well, uh, I, I'm going to start, although it's still something slightly wrong with the computer, but here we are. So what, what I want to talk about is... Um, how the warming of the Arctic and the, the loss of ice in the Arctic is having a, a climatic impact all over the world, that the, 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 is the impact of, of, of Arctic change on climate is worldwide. And so having shown that, I want to also say, well, what can we do to save the climate from from this excessive rapid warming that it's under, undergoing because of the loss of ice from the Arctic. So I'll talk about that as well. Okay, um, and a lot of this is in a, a couple of books which you might want to read. The English version of what is called A Farewell to Ice and the Italian version is called Adio Aghiacci and it's published by Palati Baringieri uh, in Torino. And um, there's a film as well uh, out at the moment, which is a full length uh, film about uh, ice and climate um, made by Leonardo DiCaprio. And it shows very nicely everything that's going on with climate change in the Arctic and what can be done about it. And in fact, this, this cover picture shows um, somebody who has poked a, a, his ice axe into a frozen lake in Siberia, which is emitting methane from underneath. So as soon as the methane comes out, he can set fire to it. And uh, this, this is why he looks as if he's on fire. So this is a, a, a nice film to, to see. It really deals with this. Uh, in in a very well uh, done way. It's... So if we start um, on this warming question, um, the top picture, uh, the bottom picture here shows that over the last thousand years, um, the the climate of the planet has gradually cooled down. Um, it it went down by about half a degree from the year 1000 when the, the climate was warm because that's when the Vikings went to Greenland and were able to grow things there. And then about the middle of the 19th century, suddenly there was a big change. And what happened was that we started burning fossil fuels, starting with uh, coal and then continuing with oil. And this is the Industrial Revolution. 
But what people didn't realize was that the carbon dioxide released when you burn coal and oil remains in the atmosphere and causes the atmosphere to retain more outgoing heat and, and warm up. Basically, the, the more carbon dioxide you add to the atmosphere, the more the climate warms up. So from a steady, slow decline in temperature leading towards what will be another ice age in a few thousand years, suddenly there was a reversal and the temperature shot up. Uh, and it's, it's been shooting up ever since very fast. And here we are now uh, well above the, the average figure of the past 1,000 years. And the top picture just shows uh, in more detail how that rise has happened. So the rise in temperature um, of the planet because has is not been uh, the same everywhere. We've, if we look at the different latitudes, we find that the, it's been far more rapid in the Arctic in high northern latitudes, and this uh, this is two to two and a half degrees has been warming in high northern latitudes, um, and this can be compared with much less warming at any other latitude in the north or the south. So the Arctic has this, it's called Arctic amplification. And it means that the, the Arctic uh, is warming far faster than any other part of the world. Well, what, what's the reason for this? Uh, we didn't suspect that uh, this carbon dioxide release was causing a climate change until the work of uh, a Swedish scientist called Svantarinius in 1896. And he wrote this uh, a very classic paper on, on this, in which he showed that the carbon dioxide that is released when coal is burned or oil is burned warms the atmosphere and um, he calls it carbonic acid in the air, which is the same as carbon dioxide. It warms the atmosphere, and the more carbon dioxide you, you inject, the, the more the atmosphere is warmed. And his estimate of how fast the climate warms was very accurate for, for its time. And um, he didn't seem to worry about it because he thought that most of this carbon dioxide would be absorbed in the ocean and this wouldn't notice in the, in the climate of the planet. But of course, in fact, it does. We know that now. Um, so what the first thing that this warming did was to start causing sea ice to disappear. Now, in the past, that is right up until about the early 1970s, when I started working in the Arctic, um, the the amount of ice, sea ice, that's floating ice, in the summer and winter is given by the light blue colour on this map. So in the, in the winter, on the right hand side, the entire Arctic Ocean and lots of other parts of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Hudson Bay, the Bering Sea, the Sea of Okhotsk, all of these areas were ice covered in winter. And the red shows ice which is called fast ice because it's fixed to land. But then in the summer, some of that ice melted, but even so, nearly the whole of the Arctic Ocean remained ice covered in summer. And uh, of course that meant that if it was a big barrier to navigation, uh, if you wanted to get to newly discovered parts of the world like North America um, from Europe, you'd have to go all the way around um, to uh, the, the tip of South America and come back up again, a very, very long journey. Um, so the hope was, why don't we try to find a way that will get us through the Arctic, straight directly through the Arctic to get between Europe and North America? And because there's lots of channels, all undiscovered, uh, so they thought they could do this. But the trouble was, in those days, when they first got the idea of let's go to, the, to America across the north, um, there was no source of power for ships. 
ships were, were all sailing ships and that meant they could only sail through the ice for a small number of months, two or three months during the summer and then they'd have to freeze themselves in like this in the winter and wait for the next summer to carry on. So they couldn't make much progress that way. Uh, they were driven by a completely false idea which was that if you go north in the, uh, uh, into the Arctic, you will come through, some, uh, through, through the ice and come into open water called the Open Polar Sea. This was a completely false idea which scientists had in the 19th century that they could come near the North Pole, they would get back into open water. Of course, they don't. Um, so this is what the, the far north is like. This is the farthest north tip of Greenland. And uh, these are Inuit Eskimo hunters hunting polar bears uh, with their dog teams. And in the background, there's an iceberg, but the flat ice in the foreground is sea ice formed by the freezing of seawater. The question was, what would happen as the climate warms up uh, because of all the CO2 released? Well, the first thing that was noticed was that the ice limits, the ice area in summer went down. And it, it started to go down about 1950. And we can see the ground line here is the summer ice, ice extent. And it started to go down in 1950 and it's been going down ever since. This is a decrease of the summer ice. These are the areas of ice in the other months of the year, in winter, spring and autumn. And it's also decreasing in those months as well, but not so noticeably, not so rapidly as the summer ice. In fact, here's a blow up of the summer ice extent uh, in the last few years. And we can see how rapidly it's going down and it's decreasing in a sort of straight line way. And when it decreases, we start to see effects. Um, the, the, the summer ice, which, which used to cover nearly all the Arctic, um, would, is now retreating. And it retreated by 2007. It retreated to the point where nearly half of the Arctic remained, uh, has open water, even in summer. So instead of the Arctic being ice covered all the year, it's now ice free in the summer. And in this case, in 2007, there was a big area of open water. And the pink line here shows where the ice limits used to be in the old days when there was lots of ice around. And then this shows where they are, were in 2007. And all this area was lost to ice and is now open water. And some more decrease occurred in 2012. And so we now have in the summer only this area of ice, white area of ice remaining. This, this is the, the, the last, last year um, where we can see it still re lying a long way back from where it used to. Now we want to know what's going on here, what's happened to the ice. So the first thing we want to know is how thick is the ice that remains. And um, you can't easily measure the, air, the thickness of ice um, except by going underneath the ice and then looking upwards with an echo sounder from a submarine. So the navies of the world, especially the US and British navies, have been very, very helpful to science by sending submarines up around the Arctic and having scientists on board using echo sounders looking upwards to give a reflection off the bottom of the ice and tell you how thick it is. So here's a submarine surfacing in the ice. Uh, you can tell, of course, to take that picture, we had to get off the submarine and stand on the ice ourselves. Um, and what we would fit the submarine with is a sonar on the bow of the submarine, an upward looking sonar called a, a type called multi beam. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it gives you a three dimensional picture of the bottom of the ice. And uh, so to do that, you have to sail with the submarine. 
And so there's, uh, scientists don't have very good accommodation on the submarine. Here we are sleeping, uh, myself and my colleague are sleeping in a torpedo rack where, where torpedoes are normally stored, not, not a cabin. But what we found, first of all, was that the ice is thinning very fast. Uh, this map shows the ice thickness um, in the year 1976, and we can, and these are average thickness values, and we can see that the average thickness near Greenland was seven meters, and near the North Pole was four meters. Then only 11 years later, in 1987, it was down to four to five meters everywhere. And then later still, in the year 2004, it was down to only two meters, two to three meters. So this is, the, that's, those are my data. This is US uh, American data, which again shows in different parts of the Arctic how the thickness has decreased over 20 years um, from these blue values in 1958 to the, the green values in 1993. Um, we would, it would be nice uh, to know actually how, what the volume of ice is. So to get the volume, we take the thickness and the area and multiply them together. And we find that in summer, the volume is now only a quarter of what it was uh, only 30 years ago. So in, in 40 years ago. In 1979, it was uh, 16,000 um, cubic kilometers, and now it's down to four. So three quarters of the ice in the Arctic has disappeared since 1979. That's a very big change in the climate. We can watch it disappear as well by mapping it um, around a, a clock pattern where we look out from the center and the distance is the, the volume of ice in each month of the year. And we can see that if we look at the black color, that's the summer month of September. And we see over the last 30 years, the ice moving in the, towards the center, which means a reduction in volume. So wherever you look at every month of the year, the volume of the ice has been retreating since the 1970s, as we look um, round towards the present day, where there's very little ice left in the center of the Arctic. This also shows um, the this, this speed at which the ice is disappearing was not predicted by scientists. Scientists who do computer modeling of how, how much ice there should be according to their ideas about energies and forces, they get this black line as their prediction. And the prediction is there'll still be plenty of ice around in the summer, right out to the year 2100, the end of this century. But the red line shows us what's really happening. The amount of ice has been going down very, very fast, and soon it will disappear within a very few years of now. It's not going to last until 2100. Also, because the ice is thinner, it doesn't look the same as it used to. This is how the ice used to look like in the 1970s uh, when I was uh, when I used to uh, work on the ice, and, and uh, it was very difficult to walk about on the ice because it was so thick and rugged. Um, but now it's much thinner and flatter, which means that icebreakers can get through it more easily. Um, ship um, drilling rigs, oil drilling rigs can operate within it. That's the, the big round ship on the left. And um, so there's, there's much less ice. This makes it very difficult for us to work. Um, it, this shows a typical way we used to work on the ice with an international scientific program of about 20 scientists would go out in the spring, in March of, of or April, um, build a camp out of uh, wooden huts, uh, have a, um, a place, a mess hut to eat in, uh, a, 
a hut full of uh, for for um, diesel and a, a scientific hut, and we would live on the ice for two or three months studying it because it was so thick and safe. But now it's not safe anymore because it's much thinner, which means it will be breaking up. So the only way we can work on the ice now is to go on a ship and then the ship sits in the ice and if the ice breaks up, the ship is still there. This, this shows how the ice breaks up now. This is a winter of 2013 and all the, the purple lines there are big cracks and openings in the ice. This is a whole half of the Arctic Ocean across this map. And the, the uh, ice is broken up uh, so that there is not an area that's big enough to have a, a runway for an aircraft. So we can't operate um, a camp on this ice because it's constantly breaking up under the influence of the wind because the ice is so thin. Now that's what's happening, but what does that do to the rest of the world? Well, I'll go through some of the effects which are not confined to the Arctic. First of all, um, when the ice retreats, it means that during the summer, an area that used to be covered with ice is now ice free. This is, shows what the summer used to look like in the Arctic, and this shows what it's like now. So the blue area here is an area that used to be ice covered and now isn't. And that has um, an effect on what's called the albedo, which is the amount of radiation from the sun, which is immediately reflected back out into space. Now, because ice is white, it reflects nearly all the radiation that falls on it. It has an albedo of about 80 to 90%. But um, as soon as you take some of that ice away, as, as in the bottom picture, the, 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 the seawater reflects much less radiation. It only reflects about 10% of what's falling on it. So much more radiation is absorbed in the, today because there's less ice to reflect it back out into space. And that means that we are warming the planet faster because of the ice retreating. So the, the loss of ice in itself is causing an acceleration of global warming. Another thing that's causing that is the fact that as the ice warms up, or the Arctic warms up, the snow la layer around the Arctic also retreats. We're having, we have less snow. And the brown area here are areas that used to be snow covered in summer, but are now not snow covered. And these are places that are very familiar, the north of Alaska, Siberia. You think of Alaska and Siberia, you think of snowy wastes, but they're not snowy anymore. The snow has retreated. And again, that means we have a dark surface of um, forest or tundra, and that's um, reflecting less radiation and warming up more quickly. This is, shows the retreat of snow over the last 40 years, and we can see how rapidly the snow area has gone down. It's gone down by at least as much as the ice area has gone down. So the ice is retreating, the snow is retreating. That means more radiation is being absorbed, and we're getting faster warming of the planet. The next thing, though, is that because we're getting this warming and the ice cover is disappearing from the Arctic Ocean, we're also getting warmer winds blowing over this great ice sheet on the island of Greenland over here. In the past, it was very cold in summer. You, you never got melting on the Greenland ice sheet. Today, it's much warmer in summer on Greenland, and we find today that nearly the entire area of the Greenland ice sheet, shown in blue, experiences melting in the summer. So the, the, water, the ice surface melts, the water runs away down through gaps and holes and rivers, 
down in, in to the ocean and increases the height of the ocean, the height of the water in the ocean. So sea level rise, which is a terrible threat to our survival, is something which is accelerating because the Greenland ice sheet is now losing ice much faster than it used to. This shows the way in which that loss of ice has accelerated. Uh, this is done by measuring the ice uh, volume from a satellite. There's a satellite which measures actually how much ice there is underneath the satellite, the volume of it. And we're, we're losing ice from Greenland at an accelerating rate. The result is, as we estimate how much sea level rise there'll be by the end of this century, our estimates keep going up because we see more and more ways in which ice is disappearing. So the blue is the way sea level rose uh, up until the year 2000, quite slowly. And then these are all our new estimates of how fast it's going to rise in the next few years. And we can expect it now to rise at least a metre by the end of this century, probably two, three or four metres. It's going to drown a lot of cities, coastal cities all around the world. And um, this will have a, a very, very bad effect. Um, this means that um, there's much more likelihood of terrible um, floods than there used to be. And, and um, we can see how fast that ice is, is, is accelerating downwards by looking at Greenland in the summer. Here I was standing on the top of the Greenland ice sheet on August the 1st of last year. And um, on that day, the ice sheet lost more ice in a single day than it's ever lost before. 12 and a half billion tons of ice melted in a single day off the top of the Greenland ice sheet. All of it went out into the ocean. The reason for that was that the air temperature was so high. It was 21 degrees, which is quite a, like a fairly warm summer day in Europe. And this has never happened before. The ice in Greenland, usually the air temperature stays below freezing. And so when you warm the air to European summer temperatures, massive melt occurs. And here we see the ice sheet melting and the water flowing away as a kind of river. Uh, and a worse effect still is the fact that when the ice melts, the dirt that was on the ice sheet, that was hidden by the fresh snow and ice, the dirt stays behind. So you're, the ice surface gets dirtier and dirtier as it melts because the ice is melting away but leaving the dirt behind. And this is called black ice. And here we see it, it's, 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 it's nearly all dirt. There's, there's not, the ice is, is underneath the dirt now. And that means that this dirt being black is also absorbing a lot of radiation and warming the ice sheet faster. As the ice sheet warms faster, um, it melts faster. So this is an accelerated melt of the ice sheet caused by the fact that the dirt on the ice sheet stays behind when the ice melts. And that causes the ice to melt even faster. And here we see dirty ice on the Greenland ice sheet melting away. And uh, you can see that uh, it's like pure mud. It doesn't feel like ice at all. Uh, the ice is underneath the mud and that mud is dark and it's causing the whole ice sheet to melt um, very rapidly. This is an extreme case. This is where the, uh, the mud is so thick that it's now dark brown. Well, where does that dirt come from? Well, um, a lot of it comes from fires. And we're now getting used to the idea that in, in the summer, we're going to have brush fires everywhere. Um, we, we were having them in the last few years in, in California. And this shows a, a, a fire that started just as we were driving past. 
near the, in the city of Pasadena. But you're getting fires now in the Amazon and even in the Arctic, the Arctic tundra is on fire. And this fire produces, first of all, it produces more carbon dioxide, but also produces a lot of, of dust and dirt um, and soot, uh, which falls everywhere. But when it falls on the Greenland ice sheet, it makes the Greenland ice sheet darker. So here we are, have our, our Pasadena fire, which lasted about three days and all the, all the freeways were closed. That's the, that's the next effect. But then as the next effect after that is another really worrying one, which is that uh, there may be a huge outbreak of methane from the Arctic. If you look at the Arctic Ocean, uh, the center of the Arctic is very um, deep water, 4,000 meters deep. But around the edges, the water depth is very shallow, only 50 to 100 meters. All this light blue is continental shelf, which is very, very shallow. Now, what's happened was that um, this shallow water underneath it is, is about 2,000 meters uh, of uh, methane gas. Can, but the methane is is combined with the sediment to form a kind of solid material called methane hydrate. And that methane hydrate is held in place by frost, permafrost, that's an icy surface to the seabed. So it's safe as long as it stays down in the seabed. But the trouble is it doesn't now, because the ice is, is melting and retreating in summer, we're having big areas around the edge of the Arctic. There's a big area around Siberia where the ice is gone in the summer and the water warms up. Here's water warming up beyond five degrees. And I've seen water warmed to 11 degrees in the summer. Um, this means that the, the layer of permafrost on the seabed melts because it's, the water is warmer than freezing point. And when that layer melts, the methane gas can come out. The methane hydrate, which is what this stuff looks like, it's, it looks like ice, but it's actually full of methane. This methane hydrate comes out uh, of the seabed and it rises up to the ocean surface. And here we see, this is a, a, a sonar picture of methane plumes rising from the seabed, which is only 70 meters down, coming up, coming out of the surface of the ocean. Um, firstly, you have to be careful when you're sailing around on this kind of surface because the methane is inflammable and you could get an explosion if you sail a ship and have any kind of flame. But the other thing is, of course, this methane is a greenhouse gas and it it, in, it increases the amount of warming of the arctic and of the world um, above what it would be just due to carbon dioxide alone so this shows the methane gas coming up it's here it's held back by the sea ice at the surface but um, it escapes and we see now when we measure methane uh, around the world we find the level of methane is going up very fast. This is a, a measuring station in the north uh, of Canada, and we see the methane level, which, which was fairly steady from the year 2000 to about the year 2010, 12, is now growing rapidly. As these, this methane comes out of the seabed in the form of methane plumes. So, that's the next thing. If that methane comes out really fast uh, and doesn't just um, come out slowly, then the methane level in the atmosphere will increase really rapidly and we'll get what's called a methane burst. And that will give us a sudden burst of global warming, perhaps a degree of warming in just two or three years, a really serious effect on the planet. That's the next effect. Then another one, uh, which is also due 
to warm me. Uh, and we notice it because it affects our weather. And this is the fact that there are two big air masses in the northern hemisphere. One is the polar air mass. That's this, this air mass sitting over the poles. And the other is the tropical air mass sitting over low latitudes. And the boundary between them is shown by a very rapid wind, which was called the jet stream. And this was because the, these two air masses were at different temperatures and uh, the boundary between them was a strong wind. And this is the wind that blows you from America to Europe if you're flying from, from west to east. But because the polar air mass has warmed up so much, while the tropical air mass hasn't warmed up so much, the, the temperature difference between the two is decreasing and that's decreasing the strength of the jet stream. And when the jet stream decreases in strength, instead of being a straight line, it's a, it's a bendy line like this. It's a curved line. And when it curves, it means that air masses up here, the polar air mass, can move, some of the air can move down towards lower latitudes. So we're getting polar air in, in low latitudes, and over here, we're getting tropical air moving up to quite high latitudes, uh, to the Canadian prairies. So we're finding anomalous weather patterns in the world where instead of having middling temperatures all the way, all the time, you can get extremely cold and extremely hot uh, weather outbreaks. And of course, we've seen these in the last few years weather records being broken either by extreme heat or extreme cold. But the trouble is those extreme heat and extreme cold events happen in the latitudes where we grow most of our food. The brown here shows areas of intensive food production, crops growth, and we find it in the middle of North America, Europe, Ukraine, Russia, these are all the places which are affected by this jet stream um, anomaly and therefore are suffering from big climate fluctuations, big weather fluctuations which reduce the production of food. This is a disaster because many, many people in this world don't have enough to eat. And if you're going to make food cost even more, it may make it impossible for them to buy food. The, the United Nations has a, a food index, which is a measure of the average price of food uh, all over the world. It was started at 100 in the year 2000, and then it rose to over 200 in 2008. It went down and then it rose again to over 200 again in 2011. And this was due to the action of these weather events caused by the warming of the Arctic. And when the weather, when the, the climate warms up or, or you have an extreme weather event, uh, the cost of food goes up because it's the, the crops fail. And when the cost of food goes up, people are living in third world countries uh, go hungry. And that means there tends to be unrest uh, revolutions, fighting going on because people can't buy enough to eat. And we see these are all the countries in the third world, in, in North Africa and the Middle East, which were subject to, to a lot of violence uh, during the years when food prices were very high. We see they coincide with years of high food prices. But we're not going to have anything but high food prices in future, unfortunately. So this is going to be very tough for the countries, um, the poor countries of the world. And that what's going to make that even harder is uh, that um, the population is going up very rapidly in all over the world, but especially in Africa where by the year 2100, we expect population to be multiplied by four. And this is the very part of the world where food is getting to be most expensive. 
Well, I'll, I'll move on quickly because I'm uh, uh, behind time a bit here. And um, I'll, rather than talk about other effects, um, which there are effects in the ocean as well, what I'll talk about now is what we can do about this. Uh, we have to do something because very clearly the speed at which the climate is warming is something we can't tolerate. Um, already we see that these carbon dioxide emissions which are causing the, um, the greenhouse effect, causing the warming, are increasing. And they're decreasing a little bit in Europe and the USA, but they're increasing rapidly in China and India, which are industrialising. And this means that the carbon dioxide level is going up. This has been measured since 1958 on top of a volcano in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, and it, we found that the carbon dioxide level has risen in, in an accelerated way right from when the measurement started in 1958 to today. And the rate of increase is going up. So we say, politicians say, we have to reduce our carbon emissions to stop the carbon dioxide rising. But we're not doing anything to achieve that. All the things we've said we're going to do have had no effect. The rate of rise of carbon dioxide continues to accelerate. So what can we do about it? So, well, there are many ideas and we have to put some of them into effect very urgently. One of them, which is this amazing piece of equipment here, is, is called marine cloud brightening. And what you do is pump seawater up these masts of a, a drone ship. You pump them up and have a fine nozzle at the top to produce tiny particles of water, which you release into clouds, uh, marine clouds. And it makes the clouds brighter if the, the particles are very tiny. The clouds get brighter and then the clouds reflect more radiation back into space. So that's a way of simulating a higher albedo. That's one way. But another way must be direct removal of carbon dioxide. That obviously is the only long-term answer. We've put the stuff in to the atmosphere, it's made the climate warmer. To solve that problem, we must take it out. And various methods have been suggested, but they all use a lot of land, like adding, adding to the amount of forest in the world. So the, the way that's most efficient in terms of using least land is taking the carbon dioxide out of the air chemically. That is, you, you pump the carbon dioxide, here we are, through, um, you pump it, well, I'll start again. You pump it through um, a, a fan. It uh, takes the, the carbon dioxide out of the air in the, chemically, and then you have to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Um, you can pump it underground, or in this case, this is a company that turns it into artificial limestone, artificial stone, which you can combine with concrete to produce a concrete that is uh, removing carbon dioxide. Or you can work with a waste, biological waste. This is waste, um, uh, uh, waste nuts, pistachio nuts. And you can, you can uh, digest that in, in this equipment, which, which turns it, uh, which, which reacts to, to, to remove carbon dioxide from the air. This is a, a university in California which gets its power this way. Um, the other way is to pump it straight underground. And this is what they do in Iceland. And here's a power plant where um, the, the carbon dioxide is taken out of the air and pumped underground where there's huge caverns because of the, the rock, the mid-ocean ridge rocks. So that can be done and is being done. Uh, but we have to do much better uh, and much treat everything much more urgently than we do. And I think uh, clearly Greta Thunberg was right in saying we've got to we've got to do this properly and seriously, not the way that older people have done it up to now. 
Um, okay, so that's what I have to say. And uh, uh, Maria Pia will now talk about Polar Educators, uh, which is an organization that, that looks after uh, how we can get this message across better to, to everybody. Grazie Peter e grazie anche a voi per questa opportunità. Eh, buonasera a tutti, eh, molto velocemente perché non vogliamo lasciare spazio per le domande, ma voglio fare conoscere il Polar Educators International, che è un network non soltanto di insegnanti, questa è la cosa che vogliamo mettere in chiaro, ma soprattutto di educatori. Adesso, scusate, parlo italiano, ma parlo in inglese, ma comunque mi sembra più semplice questo. E abbiamo la nostra missione che è Connecting Polar Education Research and the Global Community e la visione che abbiamo che è Polar Educators International is an essential network of educators and researchers aiming to provide a deeper understanding of current polar sciences to a global audience. In fact, eh, quello che vogliamo fare è di mettere insieme educatori e scienziati, perché molte volte, il, non è il caso di Peter che è molto bravo a spiegare, ma parecchie volte gli scienziati sono abbastanza oscuri nel loro modo di, di spiegare, quindi in un certo senso la figura dell'educatore sta in mezzo tra il pubblico e gli studenti anche, e ovviamente e il, gli scienziati. Um, Qui, eh, noi siamo una società che è stata fondata nel 2010, non abbiamo un, un quartier generale, si fa tutto in rete e vi darò poi il, la possibilità, quindi chiunque è interessato, non necessariamente chiunque può essere un educatore. Se parlate appunto delle regioni polari, se um, qualche interesse può venirvi anche leggendo il libro di Aidiaci che Peter ha scritto, che ho tradotto io in italiano, è una, una missione che aiuta molto a far capire l'importanza delle regioni polari perché come Peter ha spiegato gli, gli effetti delle regioni polari stanno davvero in tutto il mondo. Eh, noi siamo partiti nel 2010 eh, eh, quando c'è stato l'anno geofisico internazionale del 2009-2011 e poi abbiamo proseguito con incontri biennali eh, che sono finiti con l'ultimo, siamo stati a Coimbra in Portogallo, siamo stati ad Hannover, siamo stati a Rovereto in Italia dove c'è un insegnante molto molto bravo e il quarto workshop abbiamo fatto l'anno scorso a Cambridge e il quinto dovrebbe, doveva essere il prossimo marzo in Islanda, ma con la pandemia in corso abbiamo rimandato, non sappiamo quando lo potremo fare. Eh, questo um, uh, collega di Polar Education International Svalbard, eh, Matteo Cattadori, ha portato un'intera classe del suo quarto anno del liceo socio-pedagogico di Rovereto si sono autofinanziati e è stato, hanno fatto una ricerca scientifica veramente di grande valore. E nel nostro website, a cui siete tutti eh, benvenuti a provare, www.polareducator.org, eh, troviamo anche delle masterclasses dove appunto mettiamo insieme scienziati e eh, educatori, in modo che lo stesso argomento viene sviscerato sia dallo scienziato che dall'educatore. E abbiamo anche un uh, webinar in italiano che è stato fatto per questo network. Um, oltretutto dal dall'anno geofisico internazionale è nato anche questo libro Polar Science and Global Climate e adesso siamo in... Eh, nel momento ci vorrà ancora un paio d'anni per fare una nuova edizione. E anche questo libro sarà disponibile gratis per tutti a chi interessa. E quindi vi lascio delle, i nostri modi di contattarci, il, il website di Polar Educators, la Gmail del Polar Educators e il mio, se volete, se vi interessa anche diventare voi stessi educatori polari, anche parlarne nel, di questo argomento nelle, nella vostra vita, nei vostri posti, ci farebbe molto piacere. Eh, con questo ho finito e mettiamo ovviamente finiamo con gli orsi polari perché questa è una foto che fece Peter da una nave nell'Artico, c'era una mamma orsa con eh, gli orsetti e quindi è 
è stato anche un nostro vigneto di Natale. Eh, molte grazie, vi riporto Peter per le domande. Buonasera. Per, per tutte le persone che ci ascoltano, se volete porre qualche domanda, in tutte le, le domande, poi le trasmettiamo a Peter, a Vanna, se la, la dottoressa Casarini. And thank you, Peter, for your very deep, interesting and impressive, I would say, presentation. Uh, I'm familiar with this argument, but uh, every time I, I, I i deal with, with, with them, I, I really I feel, I feel uh, less confident about the future. Yes. Uh, uh, a question for you, Peter. Uh, uh, it's a general question. Uh, the United Nations Secretary Gervais recently stated that, that climate change should be classified as a global emergency. We know this is the situation. Uh, this statement for other full public information on the same topic. Uh, I would like to remember the entry of Papa Francesco Laudato Si. I remember the chilling words of the former uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry uh, in, uh, in Colombia, saying, saying this uh, the, the quote, not addressing climate change will lead to utter catastrophe. Uh, but many of this public statement is likely to be uh, translated into action. Into action. Uh, you, you mentioned that. To what do you attribute this difficulty to take, take this is an action against climate change? Because uh, people sometimes are optimistic, sometimes are pessimistic. What really do you think we can do in, uh, to deal with this problem with the Uh, would be a problem for uh, our children, our grandchildren, uh, and so on. What do you think? Yes, <laughs> we certainly are in a we are in a see, and we, we can't wait to take action uh, because the, the accelerated changes are really taking place. So that's already producing accelerated sea level rise. Can you hear me? Yes, Peter, yes. Okay. 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 okay, so this is producing already very, very serious effects, which is going to get worse and accelerate, for instance, the methane emissions in the Arctic. So we have to treat this as a global emergency which requires immediate action as, as the main thing we try to do without once we finish it. And um, the way I the way I believe that is the only way to save us, which I describe in the last part of my life, is to remove carbon dioxide. It's the, the carbon dioxide is what's causing the greenhouse effect and it's causing our climate to warm. And unfortunately, what a lot of people say is um, if we reduce our emissions down to some low value, but it won't because carbon dioxide, when you release it, stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. This means that if we produce any carbon dioxide from fossil fuel, the climate will keep on getting warmer. So reducing our emissions, all it does is, is that all, the only way it helps us is to get more and more slow. But we still get warmer, but we're already too warm. So the only way is actually to take the carbon dioxide out of it, not just this in, but take it out and by this and the best way I think is this chemical method where you have these huge number of plants blow the carbon dioxide over the and then you pump the gas underground or you turn it into something else that's not a dangerous gas like, like limestone. Case that I showed. But we have to do that. We have to do that at a very high level of effort. And we, get, and, and we haven't even started. So that, that's, that's a real, real yeah, take change out. 
อันอันอันนี้ได้ก็เนี้ยอันโอเวอร์ล็อกส์ thank you thank you thank you uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Maurizio Fermelli is connected and Maurizio Fermelli is the former rector of the University of Tiers I think it, 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 it has stuck quite a couple of questions for you Maurizio ci senti Not a question, Peter, uh, waiting for um, Maurizio Fermeglia, Professor Maurizio Fermeglia. In your presentation, you described a technological solution can uh, mitigate climate change. Uh, the question of many people on finance is uh, how feasible are these solutions, really, economically and practically? They are very interesting, but it looks really, really uh, ambitious. Uh, and, uh, If they can alone contribute to climate change mitigation, what do you think? You are a positive. Well, surprisingly, uh, it's actually cheaper than, than it looks. And when I first started to, to study this, um, most people thought that uh, air, air capture of CO2 was either was completely, completely impossible. Or would cost a fantastically huge amount of money. You can't do it. But in fact, uh, the more it's been studied, the less the less expensive it looks. Because the the, the firstly the, the, the chemistry of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is well known. It's been, it's been in operation for, for about a hundred years. Because when steel was first invented, they needed a way of getting rid of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere inside a submarine so that the crew wouldn't die. Uh, and the, the scrubber, the uh, passing air through uh, an absorbing chemical, was something that was developed originally in the submarine. Uh, so the, the science is well known, and the The problem is cost, but always finding technology that as you as you spend money and you develop the technology further, it gets cheaper. Just look at how cheap solar power has got in the last few years. It only costs about one percent of what it cost ten years ago. So we can we can bring the price of carbon dioxide down. Helped by the fact that some ingenious people are finding things to turn it into, like turn it into pipes, which you can sell because it's a component of concrete. So we can make money by the production of something from the carbon dioxide, and the process of getting rid of it is getting cheaper as well. It's still going to be very expensive. It's going to be probably one of the main expenditure items. For the, for the world, um, but it's what we have to do to save us, and it's not uh, it's not as disastrously expensive as it looked at first. Uh, we have some uh, uh, questions on the chat, uh, uh, a lot of questions, I would say. Uh, uh, What, uh, do you think a nuclear power could replace current energy sources and then fight climate change? Um, well, I, I used to think so. <laughs> I think the, the problem lies with us, uh, not with nuclear power as such, because we're not very good at controlling it uh, in a safe way. Um, the, the, uh, The accidents that have happened are not only dangerous in terms of climate, <coughs> but incredibly expensive in terms of damage to the planet. When I mean, you have a Chernobyl, a whole area of of the Ukraine has to be abandoned forever because uh, everything involving nuclear is involving very long-lived uh, isotopes. So, in, if if we could uh, be more efficient in dealing with nuclear power and use uh, and not use water cooled reactors, for instance, which
which are subject to these floods and tsunamis, it, it could be very good. Um, but I'm 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 kind of feel that it's not at the moment a, a safe enough uh, method for for use uh, as as in as a source of energy. When um, since we've got solar energy now, wind energy, which are both very cheap and much cheaper than power than, than fossil fuels, we can use those to supply the energy we need for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We don't have to go to nuclear power, uh, and uh, probably it's, it's safer if we don't. Uh, about the limited period of action, we talk uh, usually we talk about five, ten years uh, uh, on the newspaper. Uh, there are some authors, you know very well, like James Lover, who uh, believe it is, it, that now it's too late to, to, to deal with climate change. Uh, given that the sooner we act, the better, uh, when do you risk fully falling into an area of no return? What do you think? I mean, I mean uh, the, the date we should be doing this. Um, I mean, I don't think well, there's a, a number of kind of influential pessimists <laughs> who think that we've had it, that whatever we do now, uh, we're not going to prevent climate change from getting worse. And unfortunately, they, they may be right because the, the climate change is speeding up and all of the, the feedbacks being positive, they're tending to accelerate everything. The loss of, of ice from Greenland is accelerating. Ice has been lost from Antarctica. Um, there's uh, uh, the rate of sea level rise is increasing. The, the uh, warming of the oceans is going up. Um, every, everything is, is getting worse in a faster and faster way. So I think we still have if we if we take really serious action now, from now we we do have the possibility of of controlling global warming and in fact bring, bringing it back down through, but only through removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because then we're getting rid of the greenhouse effect by getting rid of the greenhouse gas, and that's all that's the only thing that will save us. Reducing our emissions is pointless. That's that's what the, the climate change people have tended to say. Even Greta Thunberg has said, "You've got to reduce emissions." Uh, and of course, we should reduce emissions, but in itself, that won't save us. It, it will just mean our climate will warm up more slowly, but still, it will warm up. So, only removing it from the air will will bring the climate back down. To a state where it's livable. Becoming vegetarian could help in uh, uh, mitigating uh, global warming? Um, I think you are asking what other methods could mitigate global warming. Um, well, the, there, are, there are other ways that we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and one of them that, that everybody would like to do is is reforestation that is you you plant more and more forests and the forests take carbon dioxide out of the air but it's too slow and a huge area uh, is being calculated to remove the the, the carbon dioxide produced by Europe alone would mean build growing area of new forests the same area as Europe. So the whole of Europe would be covered with forest in order to produce an effect of the carbon dioxide that we produce. So that's not feasible. So we can't we can't depend on growing trees. And other methods all follow the same problem. There is there's not enough it's not fast enough or there isn't enough money or space to do it. The only way that, that will work that, that is can be afforded and can be done without other destruction is running running air through carbon dioxide absorbed, 
doing this chemical removal of carbon dioxide in the air. I think that every other method falls down um, in some way or another. Non so se Maurizio, eh, Maurizio per bene se riesce a sentirci oppure la domanda. Abbiamo avuto qualche problema con l'auto, quindi mi scuso un pochettino. Oggi abbiamo, abbiamo avuto iniziata la riunione con uh, un cut off del sistema, quindi ci ha un po', un po messo in crisi tutto, tutta la cosa. E, intanto ne approfitto mentre aspettiamo Maurizio Fermeglia, professor Fermeglia, per uh, ringraziare tutti, cosa che abbiamo fatto all'inizio, gli enti fondatori e gli amici del Fondo Universitario che sono costituiti. Abbiamo qua con noi il vicepresidente della Banca eh, Prealpi San Biagio, volevo fare dare un saluto ma non siamo riusciti prima, comunque ringrazio la Banca per la vicinanza al nostro, al nostro polo, polo universitario. E, ecco, avete visto dalla profondità dell'analisi che ha condotto, che ha condotto il professor Barnes e, e la Maria Pia Casarini l'importanza di questo argomento. Noi speriamo di averlo portato un pochettino alla nostra attenzione, penso soprattutto, come dicevo all'inizio, ai tanti giovani che seguono e hanno seguito questo, questo evento, di quanto importanti siano questi argomenti, diffonderli e presentarli, presentarli alla, alla comunità perché siano sono presenti. Alcuni temi che avete visto, ad esempio l'innalzamento di livello del mare, il lavoro a Venezia, e che lo viviamo, lo viviamo non dico quotidianamente, ma costantemente il problema della quadra. Noi in questa zona, parlando della nostra comunità qui del Veneto, del Veneto orientale, ma addirittura no, l'Alto Adriatico, abbiamo, abbiamo un, avremo un grosso problema nei prossimi decenni di innalzamento del livello del mare. Quindi sono temi molto, molto importanti, molto delicati. Ecco, io alcune domande le ho riportate, alcune abbiamo fatto la... la, la, la la, la sintesi, e credo che abbiamo affrontato tutti gli argomenti. Ecco, il professor Fermella non siamo riusciti a collegarci. Facciamo un ultimo tentativo. E Maria Pia, grazie anche per la presentazione sugli Educators, che è veramente molto interessante, sicuramente c'è da aderire a questa iniziativa. Certo, sicuramente mi mandate l'email, mi fa molto piacere portare avanti. Ci speriamo sempre ecco, il professor Fermelia che finalmente siamo riusciti a collegarci. Maurizio, benvenuto, grazie. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, so the, the first thing, Massimo, turn your microphone off because you are the source of the echo. Okay, I, I just have a very, very, very simple question uh, that probably will imply a very complex answer. This is always the, 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 the trick. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the pandemic effect uh, on, on energy, because I, actually the main problem we are facing right now, and we will face in the future, is the carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and uh, that is directly related to energy. We need energy, and uh, there is no doubt that we're going to produce energy with fossil fuels uh, in the next uh, in the next years. So the uh, the question is, with the COVID, uh, the oil price went down from seventy-five to around twenty dollars per barrel. Actually, on April uh, 20, this year, uh, the oil price was less than zero, was less than zero. Um, there is a positive effect on the shale oil industries. Uh, most of the companies uh, went bankrupt. Uh, a very uh, huge number of uh, wells uh, is being uh, shut off. I think it's about 70% less than what it was a couple of years ago. Um, and this is mainly to defend. Uh, actually, I'll answer about, um, about energy. Uh, and yes, the, the, uh, the oil price went down very In reality, it's bound to rise. But in fact, that the great thing about renewable solar wind, waves and tides is that it's always there. It, 
it doesn't cost what it costs is simply the cost of extracting it uh, the cost of actually the cost of actually um, getting it out of the air the color the sea and so on. it does there's no raw material cost uh, with oil um, it gets it get to be more and more expensive because you're having to, to tap into oil reserves that are harder and harder to find you're producing the oil um you product that you have to go and get whereas the sun is there it's, it's there the wind is always there the renewable energy which initially world expensive. in fact when you think about it it's going it's bound to end up as the cheapest form of energy because it doesn't need any raw materials you don't have to hunt for for oil or coal it's the, the, the sun and the wind are there for free uh, so if you can find economic ways to get to extract uh, to, to get the energy it will be get better and better uh, and so oil and coal i think will fade away just because they're not going to be economically viable and i hope they fade away quickly because that, that will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being produced in the air so the, the renewable energy could save can be very helpful in in state helping to save us just by enabling us to live without carbon dioxide thank you peter unfortunately we lost uh, uh, professor camellia uh, i'm sorry for the inconvenience tonight uh, Maria Pia, Peter, thank you very much, thank you very much, we are, siamo stati veramente onorati di avervi con noi, veramente fortunatamente la parte di presentazione della, della, delle slide è stata felice, quindi credo che tutti abbiano ascoltato bene, poi abbiamo avuto qualche problema di audio, eh, come vi abbiamo detto vi aspettiamo a Portugaro, che è una bella cittadina, e quando la pandemia lo permetterà eh, grazie per la vostra pazienza per la vostra disponibilità per il lavoro meritorio che fate di divulgazione per, per, tutti, per tutti noi per tutti i nostri ragazzi veramente da parte mia nostra da parte di tutti un grazie di cuore per questa vostra vicinanza è stato un piacere anche personale così conoscerci ancora non fisicamente speriamo presto ma eh, almeno così e grazie credo da parte di tutti, tutti poi se ci sarà qualche domanda che mi pongono mi permetterò di girarvi la mia mail in modo che possiamo poi rispondere eh, ci scusiamo ancora per questi problemi che abbiamo avuto ma c'è stato come dicevo un cut-off all'inizio un, un po' disastroso che ci ha messo in difficoltà però se c'è qualche domanda, qualche interesse qualche approfondimento credo che sia Peter e Maria Pia sono completamente a disposizione ecco io vi ringrazio di cuore una buona serata e, un buona saluto, e la promessa di vederci qua a Porto Provaro grazie, grazie. buona serata e un grazie a tutti eh, che ha partecipato scuso ancora per i commenti che abbiamo avuto e una buona serata a tutti grazie e saluto